Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Brown Bag Speaker Series. My name is Vivian Jaquette. I'm with the library. And we do this series in collaboration with the Albany YMCA. And Mary Delia was one of the key organizers today, but she couldn't be here, unfortunately. So you get to listen to me. Um, next month, for our speaker, we will have someone from Save Mount Diablo. That's on April 21st. And I also want to mention tomorrow night, we've got Second Tuesday's Poetry. And the featured poets are Adam David Miller and Al Young, who is the former California Poet Laureate. So if you want to join us, it'll be in this room tomorrow night at 7. And now, I would like to introduce today's guest speaker. Her name is Kim Bancroft, and she is the great-great-granddaughter of Hubert Howe Bancroft. Her book, Literary Industries, which is available for sale after this event, introduces us to a man of great complexity and wit. A bookseller during the gold rush, Bancroft rose to become the man who would define early history of California and the American West. Kim is also a longtime teacher turned editor. Please give a warm welcome to Kim Bancroft. Thank you, and welcome, and thank you all for coming to this event today, and I thank the Albany Library for sponsoring this event. In absentia, the Bancroft Library, which I'll talk a little bit more in advance, also deserves thanks for supporting this event, and in particular, Susan Snyder, who is the the um, head of public services there helped find all of the illustrations that are in this book and makes it particularly beautiful. I'd also like to acknowledge the publishing company Heyday that, that um, created this book. You may have heard of Malcolm Margolin, who is a real figure in the Bay Area, and there's a relevant quote in here that HH said, I always had a taste more pleasant than profitable for publishing books for conceiving a work and having it wrought out under my direction. I had the pleasure of working with Malcolm over the last couple of years in uh, taking his oral histories and those of the Heyday writers, staff, family, and friends for a biography of, of Malcolm that's coming out in September. And it's been a wonderful confluence of working with my great-great-grandfather's literary industries and the book about uh, his book about his, his work as a publisher and to be working with Malcolm as well. So look forward to the heyday of Malcolm Margolin coming out. In my remarks today, I will focus a little bit on uh, at the beginning about an overview of H.H. H. Bancroft's life, for those who don't know about him and his, his accomplishments, and then focus on the role of writing in his life and the great insights he provides in his memoir about his collecting and writing process. And I hope that will be a, a good lens for learning about his library and his works. And so everybody here who is involved in some kind of creative endeavor in any way think through your own creative process as we learn about what he did. H.H. Bancroft opens literary industries explaining that this book is meant to explain how he came through the process of collecting and writing. And today, the Bancroft Library is at the University of California and has 60 million items. He began collecting in 1859. So his memoir is trying to explain both that and how he came to write 39 volumes of Bancroft's works. So what you're seeing here is Literary Industries that was published in 1890, the end of that series, 800 pages, and all of them were this thick, and they were a history of the Pacific West. He was born in 1832 and grew up in Granville, Ohio, into what he called an invigorating Puritan community. At age 16, he moved to Buffalo, New York, to work in his brother's bookstore, his brother-in-law's bookstore. And then he came to San Francisco in 1852 by steamer down one coast, cutting across the jungles of Panama, up a steamer the other coast, a, a trip of six weeks, and came to San Francisco at a time when the gold rush was not quite at its heyday, but there was still a lot of activity going on. 
Four years later, after he sold a crate of books and then another crate and more and more books for his brother-in-law back in Buffalo, he opened his own bookstore in San Francisco called H.H. Bancroft and Company. So he was very ambitious and a very good businessman and was able to have success relatively quickly. He went from selling books and stationery to printing and publishing fairly soon after that. In fact, in 1859, he wanted to publish an atlas for immigrants who were trekking across the country and coming to California. And so he asked one of the clerks at his store to pull together all of the works that they had on the West and the history of the West. And he says, I was surprised that there were so many, 50 to 75 books at the time. And then the bug got him, and he wanted to keep collecting more, and he talks about scouring every bookstore that was in San Francisco, and then when he would go on trips back east, he would ravage all of the bookstores there. He went to Europe and made a couple of collecting trips, even down to Mexico. And so by 1869, his little collection of about 60 books had grown to, to 16,000. So he, he called this bibliomania a malady, and he knew he had to resist. He was putting a lot of his money and time and increasingly other people to work trying to find these works. He would send out what became a veritable army of folks who would go up and down the coast into the Spanish missions, into the old government archives. And also he started interviewing people. He called them taking dictations. These were the first oral histories to get the stories directly of the early pioneers and settlers of the Mexican Californios. So these archives were growing and growing. And a good portion of his original memoir focuses on the how and why of this collecting. He said his, he had a very noble purpose in this. He said his purpose was, first of all, to save to the world a mass of valuable human experiences, which otherwise, in the hurry and scramble attending the securing of wealth, power, or place in this new field of enterprise, would have dropped out of existence. So he recognized in 1852, the 1850s, that California was changing tremendously from what had been a sleepy, little lonely village at first to the, the still rather sleepy Mexican presidios and missions to what with the gold rush was this influx of a tremendous amount of energy and enterprise that was changing the face of California. And for some reason, I, I still don't entirely understand, he wanted to capture that. He felt that was important to, to get through the archives and then through the writing. <clears throat> so eventually, uh, just to conclude this little bit of overview, Bancroft had 60,000 items that he had collected, he and his army of, of collectors and archivists. And he sold that to the Bancroft Library, or what it became the Bancroft Library. He sold it to the University of California at Berkeley in 1905, and it was transferred over to Berkeley. He actually, he had a store on Market Street that is now at around Market and Fifth Street, and his library was there. Then he had a scare that the, the um, a fire had started in the building next door, his building filled with smoke, and he realized he had to get his documents out. So around 1879, uh, he built a new, uh, um, a library that was made of brick on Valencia Street, where now St. Luke's Hospital is. So all of his material, fortunately, was saved because he talks about his whole bur building burning down in 1886, which would have been a terrible loss had his library still been there. And if you, you, the, you hear these dates, 1905, he sold it to the University of California. It was transferred in 1906. But fortunately, where his library was was just outside of the damage that was done by the earthquake, or it too would have been lost. So that library today, what he sold, when he sold it, 60,000 items has 60 million items. 
Everything he collected, they continued to build on, from Egyptian papyri to the papers of famous writers like the Mark Twain papers that are there, to the papers of plain folks like those of the Donner Party. There were some diary, the Breen Diary from the Donner Party is there. And recent papers of, of artists, activists, writers, business folks, scholars. So it's a really amazing collection that's really there for the public. Back in the 1860s, when Bancroft was still collecting for this library, as it was unfolding, he had his initial and growing collection at his fingertips, and that really became the source of his, his 39 volumes of Bancroft's works, this history of the Pacific West. He called literary industries a history of my history. So what made this man as a youth into a writer and a seeker? We often ask that about people who achieve some great accomplishment in the arts in, in any field. Early in his memoir, he develops the theme of causes. He was quite perceptive in trying to ask about why did I choose to do this? How did I get into this? He never formally graduated from high school, and he never went to college. And it's pretty remarkable. I mean, a lot of the work that's in here is written in German, in Latin, in French. He was very much an autodidact. So everything he, he wrote and did with his collection was motivated by this passion for scholarship that he had to fulfill himself. Having come from a rather humble farming family, there was no way that they were going to send him to college. He sent himself in the sense of reading passionately. He also talks about his mother having been a, an, a large impact because she loved to read. And again, she was a humble wo woman, but she said, I've never felt alone if I am engaged intellectually. And he clearly caught that from her and evangelizes on that point as well. Another influence that's clear is this stern Puritan stock that he talks about having come from that marked his family and his community, the sense of having to do right in the world and to do something with your life in a meaningful way. He Riley notes their commitment to self-denial and effective self, effective well-doing including in the field of abolition. He came up in a community that was an abolitionist family, and he tells a wonderful story of driving a wagon load of fugitive slaves to freedom on the Underground Railroad at age 11 in the night. And so early on, he was clearly engaged in intellectual issues and history in the making, even as a child. Then counterbalancing out the intellectual issues of the larger world, he also describes how physical labor was such an important part of his growing up. He, as a farm lad, he called it, quote, the beginning of a lifelong practice of mental and physical gymnastics that contributed to the innumerable springs of thought and action that were intertwined in his life. He returns to this theme later, the need to take care of the body and mind together if the mind is to be productive. Another cause that was early on in his life, more obscurely so, was his extreme sensitiveness, he called it. As a child, he was heartlessly bullied by other children, and he describes how he would retreat within himself, seeking solitude. And again, anybody involved in a creative endeavors knows how important it is to have that solitude in order to produce your work alone. And that be, that's a theme that comes up to him. He's got this very busy life as he continues to do his business and his collecting, but he needs to have time to himself to do his writing. He was also clearly ambitious as a young man. He said that at the age of 18, he knew already, I long to be a man, a great man. Mine must be a fruitful life. So again, we look at where, what's the wellspring of that ambition? Where does that come from? And that's something he mentioned. Now, he did have a bit of a period as a playboy in Buffalo. So at age 16, he's gone off to work in Buffalo with his brother-in-law at the bookstore. And there's a wonderful picture in here of him as a dandy at probably around age 18 with his top hat and his cane and his fancy gold watch. 
And he says he had a, had a good time leaving behind those Puritan constraints back in Ohio. But he also recognizes that those were later, in re retrospection, wasted years. And it seems to make him all the more devoted to the serious endeavors that he took upon himself later in his life. And finally, in relation to causes, H. H. Bancroft also describes an almost spiritual causation. And that's a little odd because he doesn't claim to be a, a religious man, yet he indicates something spiritual at work in his, in his big projects of writing and, cre and collecting. I cannot but feel that I was but the humble instrument of some power mightier than I. Call it providence, fate, environment, what you will. That I should leave my home and friends at the East and come to this coast an unsophisticated boy having eventually in hand in mind the great purpose of securing a, a full and complete historical data that any government or people on earth yet had to enjoy, it was the vital expression of a compelling energy. So he never calls it God or anything. He doesn't name it, but this compelling energy was bringing him to this work. Now, later, by the late 1860s, as I said, he'd collected 16,000 items. And so he describes his writing, in a sense, resulting from all of this collecting activity. What was he going to do with all this stuff that he'd gotten? The books, the pamphlets, archives. And he describes feeling a little guilty that he's got all of this stuff, good Puritan that he is, and he wants to put it to good use. And so first he had to organize this library of material. Heaps and heaps of diamonds and sawdust. Good gold and genuine silver mixed with refuse and debris. Such was the nature and condition of my collection in 1869, before any considerable labor had been bestowed upon it. Surrounded by these accumulations, I sat in an embarrassment of wealth. Where was the brain or, or the score of brains to do the winnowing? I never promised myself or anyone to do more than gather, never promised even that. And probably, had I known in the beginning what was before me, I never should have undertaken it. But now I could at least arrange my accumulations in some kind of order and even dignify them by the name of library. So he gets his library going, and then he sees that he really wants to use it in some way. And he sought to pull away more and more from the world of business and money, and instead feed his ravenous appetite for study. So we return to the spiritually ennobling purpose in this work that he had described earlier. Thus far, all through my life had my intellectual being craved ever more substantial nutriment. While in business, I was mammon's devotee, yet money did not satisfy me. I could not understand it then, but I see it clearly now. It was the enlargement and ennoblement of the immaterial me that I longed for. Often I had asked myself, is this then all of life? To heap up merchandise for those who come after me to scatter? Insatiable grew my craving, and I said, I will die to the past to money getting. I will unlock the cage of my thoughts and let them roam whithersoever they will. To be at all fitted for writing history, or indeed for writing anything, a man must have at his command a wide range of facts which he stands ready to regard fairly and to handle truthfully. Every moment of my spare time now was occupied in historical reading and in the study of languages. He had it seemed like pouring water into a sieve. The appetite was ravenous. Books, books, I reveled in books. After buying and selling, after ministering to others all my life, I would now enjoy them. <laughs> so I think there are things that we can relate to at different periods in our lives, that, that same idea, when do I get to, to throw myself into the passion of my own creative art. And certainly as I was editing this book, I'll, I'll talk about a little bit of that later, I identified with much of what he said here. Um, there's another cause for his devotion to his writing, which we find in his desire to liberate himself from depression. To back up a little bit, uh, when he had made a major trip to the 
to, to the East in 1856, he met the woman who would be his first wife, Emily. And together they had a daughter and had a very fine life uh, to, for 10 years until she died in childbirth in 1869. And he writes very poignantly about how crushed he was by that by her loss. Meanwhile, he had driven himself to near failing of health in all of this rush to keep the business going and to do his collecting and to start writing. Meanwhile, also in 1869, the Transcontinental Railroad arrived in Oakland and many people on the West Coast felt like, oh, this is going to be great. It's going to increase our commerce. No, it meant that people could now buy more directly from the East, and many California merchants failed during that time. So Bancroft said that he weathered that gale, but again, it was a very difficult time for him. And so in that period, he, de he describes himself as being listless and purposeless. And again, many of us can relate to that, going through a period where you just feel like, I don't care what my goals are, I can't manage them. I continued writing, though in a somewhat desultory manner. As yet, my feebly kindled enthusiasm refused to burn brightly. I longed to do something. I did not know what. I longed to do great things. I did not know how. I longed to say something. I had nothing to say. <laughs> and yet, I would write as if my life depended on it. The difficulty was to fell the incubi of care and a pecuniary responsibility that leech-like had fastened themselves upon me these 20 years and now threatened destruction to any plans I might make. So many of us know how that works when you've got the financial responsibilities and the emotional turmoil and you feel like you can't turn to that creative thing that pulls you. If the compulsion is strong enough and the stars line up, though, as they did for HH, the creative work can go on. And sometimes we need a little push. And that push came for him in the gentle form of a lady friend who was visiting in the East Coast in 1871. From this lethargy, I was awakened by the accidental remark of a lady at whose house I was visiting with my daughter. Her friendship had been of long duration, and her counsel now was as wise as it was beneficent. Clearly comprehending the situation, she saw that for me, activity was life, passivity, death. One day she said to me, the next 10 years of your life will be the best. What are you going to do with them? A question I had often asked myself of late without ability to answer. Yet her womanly way of putting these few simple words brought them home to me in a manner I had never felt before. What was I to do? I did not know, but I would do something, and that at once. I would mark out a path and follow it. From that day to this, I have known less wavering, less hesitation. I would make an effort, whatever the result, which should be ennobling, in which even failure should be infinitely better than listless inaction. I, I was very moved by a lot of his language in here as I was moving through my own working and writing and thinking about how best to move forward when you're feeling stuck. So for he's now newly committed to writing, and what about his writing process? There's, process. There's a, a few gems I wanted to share in this with you. For him to fully utilize that big library, and it continued to grow, he had to hire assistants because there was no way he could go through 16, then 20, then 25,000 documents as he wanted to to create his history of the Pacific West. And so he now began to hire clerks and assistants to help do the research. There was a little problem. On the back of all of these, it says Bancroft's works. So all of these other people were involved in writing, many of them. He wrote fully 10 volumes of the 39 himself, but other people were engaged in writing them, and their names were not always in the book. He was rightly criticized for that. However, in literary industries, in his autobiography, he does tell the story of, of the people who worked in his workshop, and some of those stories are saved in here. 
Another part of his writing process that he describes is the need to find a place conducive to writing, and many of us won't know that, making the kitchen comfortable or the workshop, everything is right there, a place that's quiet. And he, he called this, uh, and for him, a sequestered nook or perhaps a rural locale. He's got a wonderful description of this. I put in the preface, I moved to a cabin in the woods so I could particularly uh, enjoy, enjoy his description here. Often many a one with an exquisite sense of relief escapes from the din and clatter of the city and the harassing anxieties of business to the soft, sensuous quiet of the country with its hazy light, aromatic air, and sweet songs of birds. Thus freed for a time from killing care and reposing in delicious reverie, perhaps in some sequestered nook, thought is liberated. No buzzing of business about one's ears, no curious callers to entertain, safe with the world walled out, heaven opening above and around. Okay, so next part of his process, returning to the intertwining of body and mind. He has a whole chapter in, in here. It was much longer. I had to cut out a lot of it. But he reemphasizes that a sound mind and a sound body is only secured by giving both body and mind their due share of labor and of rest. And he, he has a whole description of how he spent his day trying to intertwine the work of writing, which he called very arduous, and the, and the ability to get some recreation. Finally, uh, he describes the freedom needed to write, and I thought this was uh, particularly apt. What chiefly has concerned me these last 20 or 30 years has been not what people were thinking of me and my efforts, but how I could best and most thoroughly perform my task to be free, free in mind and body, free of business, of society, free from interruptions and weariness. These have been my chief concern. So again, we can relate to how do we balance out all of those forces that are pulling on us. And he seemed to do a good job of it, ultimately. One more step in his overall process from inspiration to publishing is marketing. Anybody involved in producing something creative initially focuses on the all-engrossing process of getting the work out, creating it. And then you may engage in the next step, how do you get it out into the world? And if you want to just focus on the, doing the painting and making the pot happen, you don't want to have to necessarily figure out how to get it into a gallery or, or sell it. But he did. And he describes his agony in making his book tour, Going Back East, the very first uh, set of books that were in, in his history of the Pacific West were, were called Native Races. He talked about the Native Americans, the first peoples here. And he took his first book back east to eminent scholars and journalists, trying to get their approval and their reviews, including Emerson, Twain, Whittier, Longfellow, and many others. Now, remember how shy he was so he describes what it, what it was like for him to do his book tour. It was no great achievement to visit these men and command their attention. And yet, in the state of mind in which I was then laboring, it was one of the most disagreeable tasks of my life. And strong as I usually was physically, it sent me to bed and kept me there for a fortnight. So I'm thinking that after I do my book tour, I'm going to bed for a fortnight myself. The last topic I'll mention here is the role of the supportive partner in a creative person's life. After his first wife, Emily, died in 1869, it took Bancroft a very long time to be ready to find another wife who might support his literary aspirations. And he has very high aspirations, right? By 1876, when he met Matilda Griffin, H.H. H. Bancroft was deep in the work of collecting and writing. This was an all-engrossing process for him, and he couldn't imagine a wife who wouldn't detract from that process in some way. And of course, Victorian gentleman that he is, he saw the roles of women and men as very divided, and uh, his description of what he would expect in a normal wife is marked by these stereotypes. And of course, I had lots of fun going through this and reading this 150 years later almost from the time he was writing as a modern woman. 
My great fear of marrying was lest I should fasten to my side a person who would hurry me off the stage before my task was done, or otherwise so confound me that I never should be able to complete my labors. This an inconsiderate woman could accomplish in a variety of ways, as for instance by lack of sympathy in my labors, by inordinate love of pleasure, which finds in society gossip its highest gratification, by love of display, which leads to expensive living and the like. Now, those, some of those things are still true for us today. If you're creative, you know, how do you, how do you balance out all of, the, all of the society and the things that you want to have and the work? Ironically, he calls on George Eliot for a quote here, who's actually, actually a, a woman. When a man has great studies, says George Eliot, and is writing a great work, he must, of course, give up seeing much of the world. How can he go about making acquaintances? Often I had been counseled to marry, but whom should I marry? I must have one competent mentally to be a companion, one in whom my mind might rest while out of harness. Then the affection must have something to feed on if one would not see the book writer become a monstrosity and turn all into head. No, better a thousand times no wife at all than one who should prove unwilling to add her sacrifice to mine for the accomplishment of a high purpose, who should fail to see things as I saw them or to make my interest hers, who should not believe in me and my work with her whole soul, who should not be content to make my heart her home and go with me wherever duty seemed to call, or who could not find in intellectual progress the highest pleasure. Well, in my great-great-grandmother, Matilda Ban Griffin Bancroft, he did find such a remarkable woman. She was of very high intellect and very interested in his work and very supportive of it as well. She, in, she, in fact, uh, from the very beginning of their marriage, was dedicated to helping out with the editing and the writing, and he has a, a wonderful description of their, their time together all through the past and their early days. All along, down the days and years of future plottings, patiently by my side she sat, her face the picture of happy contentment assisting me with her quick application and sound discrimination, making notes, studying my manuscript, and erasing or altering such repetitions as crept into my work. At White Sulphur Springs in Santa Cruz, where we spent our first spring and summer, on the hotel porches used to sit the feathery-brained women of fashion from the city, used there to sit and cackle all the morning and all the evening while we were at our work. And I never before so realized the advantage to woman of ennobling occupation. Why should she be the train in vain and trifling thing intellectually that she generally is? But we little cared for any of them. We were content. Nay, more, we were very happy. Rising early and breakfasting at 8 o'clock, we devoted the forenoon to work. After luncheon, we walked or drove, usually until dinner, after which my wife and daughter mingled with the company, while I wrote often until 10 or 11 o'clock. In this way, I could average 10 hours a day. So Matilda was clearly valuable in helping him work out his writing, editing, and she was also, also an uh, oral histor historian. Remember, he had this whole army of people going out across the West to collect the stories, as was he. And he talks about a trip that he that she took with him even when her baby was very little. In 1878, she wrote a wonderful diary about this trip that they took up to Vancouver by steamer, by rail, by stagecoach, by wagon, rugged traveling for a woman in those times. And it, it was part of their effort to continue capturing the West. And in this way, she actually became an oral historian herself. He says, Mrs. Bancroft begged permission to assist and took from one person, a missionary, the Reverend Mr. Good, 120 fool's cap pages descriptive of the people and country. In this narrative, which was very fine, she took special interest, and during our stay in Victoria, she accomplished more than anyone engaged in the work. Writing in her journal of Mr. Good, she says, his descriptions of scenery and wildlife 
are remarkable for vividness and beauty of expression. His graphic pictures so fascinated me that I felt no weariness and was almost unconscious of effort. She also was very important when he took a trip to Mormon country in Utah, and it was much more appropriate for a woman to take a Mormon woman's oral history than it would be for a man. So she, so she was uh, very important in his, his work there. He summarizes their relationship. I'll con conclude, this is the last passage I'll share. Much of the labor of these volumes was performed at my home where was the sweetest and most sympathizing assistant a literary drudge ever had. Many a long day she has labored by my side, reading and revising, many womanly aspirations she has silenced in order to devote her fresh, buoyant life to what she ever regarded as a high and noble object. So just so you know, I'm actually going to be doing a presentation at the Mechanics Institute Library as my great-great-grandmother. Girls just want to dress up. So I've got a wonderful Victorian attire and I'll be talking about this book and from the perspective of Matilda Bancroft in, on May 8th in San Francisco. The last topic I'll share with you is how is my own writing process. So how did this 800-page doorstopper become this slender illustrated book? I myself am a longtime writing teacher, and to be honest, I had little time or inclination to spend getting involved in my family history. I knew the Bancroft Library was there. I was very proud of it, but I had my own students to, who's had many papers that I needed to write on. Then in 2009, the Bancroft Library was renovated, and the wonderful curator of Western Americana there, Teresa Salazar, had on display one of these beautiful diaries from my great-great-grandmother. And she said, a little, a little, was a little bit of a, a finger wagging there, Kim, you should really come in here and look at these papers. Your great-great-grandmother was a writer in her own right. And she was right. There were many diaries there, letters, albums, things that were just fascinating to see. And once I started looking at those papers, along with those of H.H. H. Bancroft, I realized, OK, I have to go to the source. I need to find out more about the family history that's embedded in here, along with all of his analysis of his collection and how he wrote. So as I was going through, through the book, I started copying out a few pages here, a few passages there, and sending them via email to my family saying, hey, look at what the old man wrote. Isn't this cool? So as I was in the Bancroft reading, uh, reading room one day, going through the yellowed pages, the then director of the library, Charles Fallhaber, uh, was visiting and I said, oh, I'm really enjoying reading literary industries and he's actually pretty funny and he's got great literary style. And Charles said, I've always said there's a good short book in there. So I don't know why I took that as a challenge. I was already copying out a few pages here and there and you know, what's a couple hundred more pages over a few more months? And then one day when I was visiting with Malcolm at Heyday, he asked me what I was working on. I had left teaching behind, and I said, oh, I just copied out the essence of literary industries. And of course, he knew H.H. H. Bancroft, another publisher who had come to California from the East and made good, and he wanted to see it, and here it is. So that's been a wonderful journey in myself. It was very daunting to cut this all down. I always invite people, if you feel that I have missed anything, you go back to the original. And it is important for people who are librarians who are very interested in his collection and the history of it. Um, but I think that I've captured the essence of his good narrative right here. And because he was self-educated, I think he had a little bit of a chip on his shoulder to prove everything that he could by explaining himself fully. And I think you get an essence of his brilliance and his showmanship in the, in the slender version. So that's the, that's the end of my presentation. We have a little bit of time for questions. And I do remind you, I have no pretensions at being a historian. I was an English teacher, and I just got out my red pen, and I said, be concise. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I had three 
questions. First of all, he surely wasn't christened H.H., H., so what was his real name? <laughs> Hubert Howe Bancroft. Yeah, and in our family, thank you for asking, we, we usually refer to him as H.H., H. and then I go back through some of the documents and other places his wife called him Hubert. Okay. Then, where did he store all this stuff over the years? Did they have huge houses? Or well, no, they... no. So he had his, he had ori originally his store in San Francisco. The first place he opened was on Merchant in Montgomery, and then he opened another one that's actually still there. It's called the Bancroft Building. The building is there on, at 721 Market Street, and that became a five-story building that had a bookstore and a printing industry, and on the fifth floor was his original library. And then, like I said, he got scared about fire happening because things were burning all over the place in early San Francisco. And so by the late 1870s, he had moved, he had built this, this brick building on Valencia Street. You were talking about the mind and body connection. What 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 was his uh, emphasis on the body? Did he have a special kind of exercise or no, walking? No, he just or? he he would talk about going out riding the horse or walking or. Um, I think he did do some kind of calisthenics, but he also chopped wood and he was able to just keep the body going in an active way. Good question. Yeah. So I'm I'm curious about his first daughter. Um, especially given the part that you read about women and yes. the po impossibility of finding another wife. Um, so she would have been like she, 19 or 20 at that point where he was writing that. And so I'm wondering what she was like mm -hmm. and if she was not interested in his... In other words, you'd think that he would have had a different view of what women could be like having a yeah. daughter. It was the 1870s, and so it's been important for me to look at various opinions that he had, whether it was about women or about Indians, this contradictory attitude of respect on the one hand and also questioning their role because that was his how he was grown up himself. But as far as that, what was interesting for me when I started, when I read this, I had never known there was a first wife. I had grown up hearing about Matilda and the three sons that they had. Well, he also had another daughter with Matilda, and there's a, a picture in here of the four children. But essentially, he didn't see women as having a very useful role. They didn't need an education. They were going to go off and be married. And yes, he wanted an intelligent partner. Again, that's the contradiction. And clearly, Matilda did a great amount of work for him. And his daughter did, too. When they went off to the missions, she wrote a little diary about what she experienced when they were 14 years old. And she was involved in helping out with the business. But they ended up parting ways. And so it's been interesting for me to go back and meet some of the descendants, her descendants, that I had, hadn't even known existed, kind of finding them, thanks to Google, our new search engine. And the... So that was your grandmother? Well, Matilda was my grandmother. Emily was the, the first wife that I had not known about, and her daughter. And then later, when he married Matilda, so Emily died in 1869, and then he married Matilda in 1876 and started a new family. Kate was still part of that family, and some of this I've learned through going back through the, the letters and diaries. Well, no, Kate was you know dead long ago, but I've met her, her descendants now. Oh, and Yes, so, so that's been very interesting. And actually, uh, when Emily died, she wrote all of these wonderful letters. Well, before she died, obviously. she In the 18, 1860s, she had come from Buffalo herself, and she would write what she called her journal, which were a series of letters. And the letters could only go out every 10 days by steamer. So she'd start a letter on this thin onion skin paper on Monday and then continue on Tuesday writing to her parents and a whole other set to her sister describing what life was like in San Francisco in the 1860s. If any of you know the, the corner of California and I believe Goff, they had a house there and she describes that they had moved so far away into the sand dunes that nobody would come to visit them. 
So these are charming letters, and I found them all bound at the Mandeville collection at UC San Diego, and I had no idea that they existed there. But of course, her husband, Emily's husband, was a bookbinder. So once she passed away, he, he, the family had saved all of those letters. He had them bound, and her descendants lived in San Diego. So they're now there. So I've made a few of my own ar archival trips down there to, to look at those papers. Yes, May 8th at the Mechanics, yes, at the Mechanics Institute Library and Matilda. It's in San Francisco. So if you look it up online, I don't have the, the, the specifics here. Mechanics Institute Library. Thank you. Yes. Um, I'm curious about when you say you extracted from a big book to make an elegant slimmer book, what was your... What was your process or what was that's a good question cut 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 and 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 it was really hard in places i just felt like oh this is such a great story i bet i can't include it i i would say probably at the beginning of a lot of his his chat each chapter there was a sense of kind of rooting in what was the narrative and then he might go off onto I don't want to say a rant, but many of them were these long diatribes about how people, you know, newspaper writers were changing the sentiments of the real world and how college students aren't really using their college education. Some of it is pretty relevant, right? But so where it was clear that he was going into essay writing mode and using it, I mean, he, he, this by, by the time he published this, he was self-publishing, so he could afford to say what he wanted to say. And so the essay writing came out, and I really tried to stick to the narrative of his life and his accomplishments. So that's a good question. both of those, uh, you know, in a broader sense of how he's seeing them unfold, and, and what was the impact of the Civil War, particularly on his outlook. He's a young man, and, and just quickly, the second question is, when, in, in reading all this, can, did you identify one sort of familial trait that you said, oh gosh, this is what's passed down you know, for generations, that you have shared with your siblings or whatever? Well, I'll start with that question. Not really, although there are things, I mean, I, I'm a very hard worker myself, and I got that from my father, but it skipped a generation. My grandfather, I think, kind of took up the playboy role there, and, and uh, it's okay, Granddad, you know it's true. Um, and so it's, it's hard to say so many generations. I mean, what's the influence of knowing that I had an ancestor who did all of this work? I think to some extent, it was my fascination with history and then later with oral history in particular it perhaps had some influence on that. I, I remember taking my grandmother's oral history, just putting a tape recorder in front of her when I was 19 and being enchanted by her stories. She grew up in very poor conditions in, in Florida and hearing her say, well, yes, we used to get an orange for Christmas. That was it. And being astounded by getting to reach back into history and hear those stories. As for HH's, the context of the larger world, he doesn't always refer to that. I mean, the Civil War, what's interesting is in California, there, it was so far away, really, at that time. There was still no transcontinental railroad. People had to trek through uh, up one coast and down the other. And he doesn't, he doesn't refer to a lot of the political events. He did in later essay, essay books. He wrote books. He continued to pu publish books of, his, of essays, and that came after this. Yes. Yes. So the regional oral history office at the Bancroft Library is is kind of one of the subsections of it, like the Twain Papers is, or the uh, the whole office of the Egyptian papyri, and and so those are amazing documents, and you you know you can get so many different kinds of oral histories there from people who were, I, for example, there's a, the collection of the Ro Rosie the Riveter, the people, women who worked in the war industry and um, the people who were part of the free speech movement at, at uh, UC Berkeley. And so there's amazing resources there. And many of them are online now. UC 
um, Berkeley and the libraries in general are trying to get a lot of their documents online. So to have, to have them more accessible. And you might find something from your own uh, ancestor tucked away. He lived in San Francisco for a good portion of the time. He also, he had asthma, as did one of his sons. And so he kept trying to find places to go that would be out of the fog and the cold. And they ended up buying some land in Walnut Creek when there really was a creek there and uh, started a, a pear farm there. And there's actually a wonderful little picture in here from one of the fruit crates. And he loved doing that. And then even then the fog was crawling over the hills and they wanted someplace even drier and ended up going to, to San Diego. And again, as I was starting to do these papers, I, I was looking at letters that he wrote about about a, a farm that was in San Diego. And I said, what? I didn't know they had a farm in San Diego. Well, there's a place called the Bancroft Ranch House Museum that's still the re remaining at on the land that they used to have. It's now surrounded by apartment buildings and auto shops, but they have kept a little um, a museum, tiny museum at the Spring Valley Historical Society. So he loved that property and he was kind of going back and forth up and down California. It amazes me. I mean, I find getting in a car and driving to San Diego onerous and for him it meant getting on the steamer overnight or, you know. Yes. He is my great great grandfather. So uh, his second his second wife Matilda had four children, three boys and a girl. And the oldest boy was named Paul Bancroft Sr. And to make it really easy for you, he had Paul Bancroft Jr. and then he Paul Bancroft Jr. had Paul Bancroft the third, and that's my father. So it's five generations. Yes. I don't think so. I I think they. I don't know actually where if it, what they're what else they're planning. I mean, talk about a doorstopper with the the um, autobiographies coming out. But there's so many wonderful papers in there. So I think they'll continue to be publishing over time with different parts of it, and maybe f they will also find an edited version that will be very accessible. There's also at the Bancroft Library, they're having an open house day on Wednesday, March 22nd, and Matilda will also be showing up there. But it's a wonderful event from 10 to 3. They're calling it an open house museum day where they will have all kinds of things on display that they can't usually pull out. And they've got amazing artifacts that are tucked into the bowels of the building. So if you have a chance, you have time, and you can get up to the Bancroft Library on that date. And, and uh, it's Wednesday, I believe it's March 22nd. That's a Saturday. Oh, okay. Saturday. March 20th, then. 20th? March 20th. Is it Thursday? It's Wednesday. <laughs> I think it's the 20th. It's from 10, 10 to 3. Yeah. So it's just an open house. You can go in and... Matilda will be at a, at a table and ready to sit down and talk with anybody who wishes to. The 20th, March 20th. All right. But it's March. It's Wednesday, March 20th. Of March? See why one needs to go home and sleep for a fortnight. <laughs> it's come one, come all, the Bancroft Library open house, Wednesday, March 26th. Yes, thank you. And I'll put this out on the on the back if you want to look at it. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Yes. Collecting these enormous numbers of yeah. books. I wonder what your great great grandfather would have made of Google. <laughs> <laughs> or 
Oh, yes, I, I think he would have been astounded. And I don't know, you know, I think that there's always this reaction of the next generation to the technology that comes and changes everything. But I think he might also, because he was visionary, he might have said, this is wonderful. We now have all of this information. He wanted to save this information so that people would have access to it, and he was desperate. Uh, before his library got sold in 1905, he'd spent 15, 20 years thinking about, what am I going to do with this? I don't want it to be divided up. I want it to be all in one piece. I want people to have access to it. So I think he probably would have thought, this is a really great thing. Yes. No, I don't know that in particular. Don't. Yes, very much so. Well, thank you again for coming and.